you can get it. All right. Linda, are hey. we ready? Hey, Jim. That'll be over at one thirty. That'll be over at uh, one thirty. All right, then. Um, I am going to call us to order then. All right, so to, to call us to order today, I have a Himalayan uh, chime from um, Nepal. So here we go. We don't have the, the usual rotary bell. So uh, thanks to everyone for joining today. I'm Jim Dorsett, president of the Rotary Club of Raleigh. Uh, glad to welcome everyone today. We've got a terrific program for today. Philip Cave, CEO of Pharmazam, uh, will be speaking to us. And um, we are looking forward to, to his remarks very much. Um, your um, speaker is muted by our ringmaster Valerie during the, uh, during the meeting, uh, unless you uh, raise your hand to, to speak, to ask a question. Um, you can ask questions uh, by typing them in um, uh, and, and signaling Val. Um, remember while uh, we're doing social distancing and you can't go out and you need to shop online, use Amazon Smiles. So a uh, percentage of all funds spent on Amazon Smiles uh, goes to benefit our uh, Rotary supported uh, charity. And um, we hope that you'll take advantage of, of Amazon Smiles during this time. Um, I'll now call upon Charles Edwards to give our invocation. Thanks, Jim. Good afternoon, everybody. Each of us is a minority be it race, religion, sex, or nationality. But each of us is part of some majority. As such, we must be mindful of how we treat others. We must pledge our best efforts to help one another and to defend the rights of all of our citizens and residents. As Rotarians, we are gathered to today with the shared belief to treat our fellow human beings with respect and dignity. As we work together on behalf of all who live in this city, may we gain strength and sustenance from one another through reason and compassion. As Abraham Lincoln said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That is my religion. And as Harry Truman wrote, it's remarkable how much you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Thank you. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, in liberty and justice for all. I believe that we have one guest on, Mr. Sturham from the club. Welcome, Fred. Thank you. Appreciate it. Is there anybody else who's a guest to the um, to the meeting? Charles, we have uh, Jack Clayton. All right. Yes. And Welcome, Jack. We also, uh, I think, have Lars von Kantzow, also a friend of our speaker, and myself and Jack. Um, who's the former CEO of Nomico. And I think that uh, Gwen from the Southeast Rotary Club is joining us today, former Dean of Admissions at Duke <laughs> University School of Law. Um, and uh, I just see a note from past president Mary Moss on my screen, a little humor there. Uh, so really glad to welcome everyone today. Um, we're, we're looking forward to a great meeting. So um, I wanted to I get- can, Just before you move on, yeah. Jim, um, we sent out a membership survey last week uh, via SurveyMonkey. Everybody should have received it. Um, I didn't have a chance to check the and get an update 
as we had no power here in this part of Raleigh until only a couple hours ago. Um, so I've been trying to put everything back together again. But we had, as of yesterday afternoon, about 23% response rate, um, which if this was a usual survey would be excellent, but we really need to get everybody's response in as quickly as possible so that I can report to the board um, early next month. So if you haven't found it on your email, uh, email me. Uh, if you have, please complete it. It's nine questions. <laughs> It'll take you about eight minutes to do. So it doesn't take a lot of your time, just but we really need the information. Thanks. And that's uh, the link is also at the bottom of the newsletter that went out this morning. Thanks, Valerie. Okay, Bye. I'm done. All right, Val, and thanks for the excellent newsletters. Those are just fantastic. One page, short and sweet. It's got all the current info on there and some useful links. So everybody, please, please pay attention to that. Um, okay, one, a couple more reminders. Um, so please uh, remember uh, as promptly as possible to pay your dues. We've had uh, a very good uh, early response, and uh, we need to get the rest of the dues in, of course, to support our club and our public service programs and to, uh, to meet our balanced budget target and to make Treasurer Tom happy. Let's put a smile on, on the treasurer's face with getting all of our dues paid in short order in the next week or so. Um, let's see. Also, a reminder. Uh, on attendance, you can uh, get credit for a makeup uh, by watching uh, our programs online. If you've missed a program, we've got uh, the speakers. They're all recorded. They're, they're accessible. We've had, of course, some phenomenal speakers recently. Today will be no exception. Uh, so, so check out the speakers online or attend an online meeting of another uh, club. Uh, you can also do that. The Southeast Raleigh Club is now meeting regularly on Tuesday nights. And I think I saw that Sharon from the Southeast Raleigh Club also has joined us as a guest. So we're happy to welcome her. And hopefully there's some other uh, members of the Southeast Raleigh, our newest club, uh, online as well. Um, all right. Next week's speaker um, is going to be uh, Dr. Vernon Jordan. He is a scientist head of, of Sigma Xi, uh, Richard Watkins, was able to recruit uh, Dr. Vernon to join us to be our speaker next week. Um, Rufus Edmiston, former Attorney General and Secretary of State and author, will be our speaker later this month. Uh, and we have, we have just a phenomenal lineup of speakers ahead for you in May and June and, and on into uh, the next Rotary year. Uh, all right, with that, I am going to turn the floor, oh, the cart bucket and happy dollars. All right, so spare change or dollars for combating Alzheimer's and for Alzheimer's and dementia research. Uh, if uh, Charlie Upshaw is on the line, uh, I believe I saw him. Uh, Charlie, how about happy dollars and cart bucket? Have some, they're asking me to do happy dollars, sir. Bear with me a sec. Okay. <laughs> Anybody got any happy dollar news today? Nope, I don't. Go ahead, carry on. Okay. <laughs> I guess that was Surrey there, Jim, President Jim. <laughs> he sounded like a curmudgeon there. He did. He did. <laughs> I brought him a little Chick-fil-A for lunch, and we're watching, the sh watching your show here. <laughs> All right, well, I'm praying that he has not also grown a beard like Lynn Jordan and myself and Mike Toddy and Charles Edwards and a few others. I'm sure he's looking sharp as ever. All right, so on, uh, on the cart bucket and happy dollars, as you know, you can email uh, Linda and um, she will just simply bill you and you can pay online or you can send Linda a check. So um, we, we're still continuing to set uh, the standard for donations to Alzheimer's research and, and combating that, that dread disease. So thank you so much for that. 
All right, I'm going to turn the uh, floor over to Christy for a report on Rotary Club of Raleigh membership. All right. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I wanted to give first a quick update on Thursday's virtual social. It was really fun. We had about 14 people, um, and Gwen and Sharon from the Southeast Raleigh Club joined us, so that was great. Uh, we got to catch up on everyone's quarantine activities, exchange some fun stories, some Netflix recommendations, lots of fun stuff. So we'll definitely be doing it again next month, and we'll let y'all know ASAP uh, the exact date for that. But we hope we can get even more of y'all to join for the next one. And uh, last week I mentioned we're forming a Karen Concerns subcommittee to put under our membership committee. We still need uh, some people to volunteer for that. Again, uh, the responsibilities will just be to have an old-fashioned kind of phone tree, not too many people for each person to call, but just want to split up those calls uh, to check in on some of our, you know, less tech savvy and less connected members that may not be able to join us via Zoom each week. And just make sure that um, they're doing okay and that they're, they're, let them know they're still part of the Rotary family. And um, just to, since we're virtual right now, I won't see them till you know, June at the earliest. Uh, make sure they're still included. So if you're interested in that subcommittee, please let me know. You can email me, um, shoot me a message in the chat right here, and um, just get a nice little crew to get ready for that. And exciting news today, we'll be doing our very first uh, virtual induction of a new member. It's Major Al Newsom. You can see the picture up on the screen right now. And um, let's see, I don't know if we're gonna try to highlight his video in here if we can. Maybe we'll get to hopefully see him <laughs> during the induction. Here we go. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, fellow Rotarians, it is my privilege and pleasure today to welcome into membership Major Al Newsom, the Area Commander for Salvation Army of Greater Raleigh. Major Newsom is sponsored by Bill McLaurin. The application has been reviewed and approved in accordance with our club constitution bylaws. Major Newsom will now proceed to admit you into membership into the Rotary Club of Raleigh and to the friendship of Rotary throughout the world. The ideal of Rotary is service, as our principal motto is service above self. And the object of this club is to encourage and foster this ideal as a basis of worthy enterprise. We expect you to share in this effort. You've been approved for membership because we believe that you will be a worthy representative and that you are interested in the ideals of Rotary and willing to share in translating these ideals into action. You've agreed to accept the obligation of membership in this club and to obey this club's constitution and bylaws. At this time, I now have the pleasure of asking Shanna Filter, Development Director for the Salvation Army, to pin the Rotary emblem on Major Newsom. We hope you will wear your pin with pride. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Raleigh. And fellow Rotarians, I won't ask you to rise because then we'll lose you in our video feed, but please give a little virtual round of applause here for Major Newsom. We're so happy to have you as our newest member and congratulations and welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. All right. So this is great. We're really excited to, uh, to have Major Newsom join our club. Um, the Salvation Army does so much to help citizens in need in Raleigh um, with, with food, with rescue from drug addiction, rescue from human trafficking, and uh, we're, we're so pleased to have you as a part of our organization, Major Al, and also um, we're sending a, a check to you on behalf of the Salvation Army this week from our foundation, the Rotary Club of Raleigh Foundation, for $1,000 to further support your great efforts to help those in need in our community. So welcome, Major Al, and we look forward to seeing you at many, many future meetings. And thank you so much. Thank Christy? you. Um, that is actually it for me today. So uh, you can go ahead and uh, hand the floor back to you. All right, President-elect, Eric Stevens has got a report for us on the Southeast Raleigh Club. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, yes, I uh, uh, just have a short report. Uh, I was able to attend uh, last Tuesday's meeting of the Southeast Raleigh Club. 
Uh, they are still uh, just rolling along. Um, they had a nice group. Uh, the speaker was Trista, Trista Brody, um, who owns a business that provides hospice type services to elderly and disabled people throughout Eastern North Carolina, I believe. Um, she was a great speaker, talked a lot about uh, how it's important to um, not only care for the people that you are working for, but to take care of yourself. And she gave an interesting explanation about uh, uh, what it's like to, to care for these people um, and comply with social distancing restrictions. Um, they inducted a new member, uh, Byron Laws, um, and we heard about how uh, they have adopted three parks in Southeast Raleigh already. So uh, great meeting, lots of great things going on there. Um, and then uh, two of their members, uh, Gwen Swenson and I believe Sharon DeCoster, uh, uh, joined our uh, virtual social on Thursday. And I th think maybe both of them are uh, visiting us today. So um, uh, welcome to Gwen and Sharon. Um, and that's, that's about it. All right, Eric, thank you for that report and thanks for being such a great liaison uh, to the new club in Southeast Raleigh, along with Mark Hackett and Linda Monaghan. Really appreciate that great work. Uh, yeah, this club is up and running and thriving and growing and planning service projects and we're looking forward to gathering in person uh, once we can uh, gather in force and uh, do more public service projects. Uh, in the parks and, and so forth. Um, so we really appreciate the great spirit that you're showing there. Um, so just a quick update for Gina who couldn't join us today uh, on service. We have, um, first of all, our foundation, as I mentioned, has made a $1,000 donation uh, to the Salvation Army. Uh, we've also made a $1,000 uh, donation to the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. We've made uh, a donation to Rex Healthcare Foundation, which is doing great work helping those in need in the community. Uh, we're also supporting Wake Smiles and the Dementia Alliance. We have sent a thousand dollar check to the Dementia Alliance. Um, so this is great work that our club is doing through our foundation as well as club members. And I also wanted to indicate that despite the shutdown where we can't go out into the community and show up in force to pack meals or clean up a park or plant trees uh, or do our other service projects in person, our members are uh, enthusiastically supporting charities at this time. They're doing work in their neighborhoods, they're doing work at their church, they're helping their elderly or shut-in neighbors, and they're also donating and I'm proud to report that um, we've raised, including our foundation donation, uh, almost $2,500 for the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. Um, you'll see a link where you can easily donate online to the Food Bank, uh, which I actually did yesterday. And if I can do it, believe me, anyone on this uh, Zoom meeting can, can do that. It was very quick and um, you, you just, you know, hit the, click the links and donate, and you can use credit card or, or you can send a check, and then indicate in honor of the Rotary Club of Raleigh and person to notify Gina Yakomi so that our club gets credit for all of our individual donations that, that people are making. So thank you so much for that. A few additional announcements. Uh, Lynn Jordan has a birthday uh, today, and there he is looking great. Uh, with his new beard that he's sporting. And uh, former FBI agent Lynn Jordan, he's one of our favorite members. And uh, Lynn, happy birthday to you. Taylor Dewberry, Smith Anderson Young Associate, has a birthday today as well. Patrick Riley, tomorrow. Charles Edwards, uh, also uh, bearded at this meeting, uh, has a birthday on May the 2nd. And anniversaries, Terry and Millicent Snow, uh, have their 33rd wedding anniversary on May the 2nd. All right, um, so celebrate those, those birthdays. And uh, now um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, uh, my good friend, Philip Cave. Um, I'm not going to give 
Philip the full introduction that he deserves because I want him to have the maximum time uh, for his remarks because he's got a lot of uh, current and useful information uh, to share with us regarding customized medical care, customized medications, um, patients sort of taking control of their own health care uh, and, and being able to determine drug interactions and adverse uh, interactions potentially to save lives and, and also what they're doing in regards to COVID. <clears throat> but I do want to give a, a, a brief introduction. So Philip grew up in Buenos Aires, Argentina, uh, son of missionaries. Um, he was an ace soccer player. He played uh, soccer in Buenos Aires. Uh, I asked him if he was still playing soccer. He said that golf seemed to be a little easier on the knees these days. So like many of us, he's uh, taking a walk on the dark side and is playing, uh, playing golf these days. Um, Philip has had a career in um, asset management and financial advisory services. Uh, he's been with the, the top firms in the country. He's worked in New York, Atlanta, and most recently heading um, securities for Wells Fargo in Raleigh. Um, He's married to Shannon. Uh, they have uh, two grown sons. Uh, they live in Raleigh, and we hope that that stays that way. Shannon's a native of Wilson, so we, we have high hopes, and they enjoy Topsail Beach, and their sons uh, go to UNC Chapel Hill. So we're very hopeful of keeping Philip here and away from Tampa. It's too hot down there in the summer. Uh, also, uh, Philip is an avid scuba diver. He likes history. He likes opera. He uh, is an avid traveler uh, and a great parent along with Shannon to their, their two sons. Um, Philip also uh, was a Rotarian in Atlanta and a Paul Harris Fellow. So um, that, that's a, a great asset also. And um, Philip, I, that, there's so much more to say, but um, um, you're a great friend to many of us in the club. We really appreciate you uh, spending your time. Philip is the CEO since uh, last year of Pharmazam. And uh, Philip, with that, I'll turn the floor over to you um, and uh, let you tell us about the future of medical care in the U.S. Thank you, Jim. And I guess I should do an audio check. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Thumbs up, good. Before I get into PharmaZam, I also want to introduce one of my colleagues who's going to be jumping on here in a short while, uh, Scott Taylor. Scott is our Chief Information Officer, and Scott is in Tampa, and he'll give you the weather report there uh, probably a little bit later. But uh, he brings 25 plus years in the technology <coughs> sector, uh, everything from uh, application management to, uh, as well as project management, he is uh, graduated from college. He worked for Coca-Cola for years in their IT group, as well as other um, institutions. And probably is over the course of his career, has developed over 300 plus uh, applications and software packages for uh, companies all around the country. And so we're just thrilled to have him heading up our uh, information technology group. And Scott will be chiming in here in a minute. So um, welcome to Scott. Thank you, Jim for the wonderful announcement. And um, uh, I always enjoyed the times I visited there uh, with your Rotary Club and when I was working downtown and would love to continue that conversation as well. Um, Pharmazam, you know, what's interesting is when Jim asked me, gosh, I don't know what, two, three months ago, if I would uh, be willing to speak, uh, the world was a very different place as we know. And he was intrigued with what we're doing <clears throat> within uh, medicine, um, but then go back about a month, month and a half ago and throw COVID on top of this. And this has really just taken on a whole different um, uh, view for not only Pharmazam, but it's kind of thrust us into the uh, space of what we define as precision medicine. So what is Pharmazam? Who is Pharmazam? Pharmazam is a personalized healthcare medication management system. And what does that mean? Is if you think in typical fashion when uh, people take medication. 
there may be opportunities where you might have a drug to drug interaction, I mean in an adverse way or known as a contraindication. Uh, it could be drug to drug, drug to gene, uh, drug to known allergies that you have, uh, as well as drug uh, to your medical history, as well as lifestyle questions that, uh, that you would answer along the way. So the goal within Mar Pharmazam is to literally put the power of their medical records in the palm of their hands, literally within their iPhone. So when they speak with their physician, with their pharmacist, uh, or just a broader healthcare provider, that they are bringing to the platform, you know, here's my phone, here's who I am, here's um, everything about my genetic information. Because if you think about it this way, uh, the consumer, and, let, and let's just give credit to what credit's due, be it uh, our iPhones, Android systems, whatever, is the power that we bring uh, within our phone is really about content. And if you, prime example, if you go to sell your house today, probably the first thing you do before calling your realtor is just go to Zillow and say, this is where I think my house is worth, or at least have an idea. Or we buy a car, maybe go to Cars Guru or something like that, another app. Um, or before you buy a large screen television, you go to Amazon before you go to Best Buy. So people have literally the power of information uh, in the palm of their hand, except their healthcare. Uh, we count on uh, literally the hospital systems or your primary care physician or your healthcare provider to have that information with you and assuming that it's updated. So PharmaZam has kind of turned it upside down and said, or as I would say, we've uh, democratized uh, the personal health information. And this goes back to our founder, Scott Gostala down in Tampa, who several years ago, and this is in the evolution of this thing called pharmacogenetics. And by the way, that's just a very fancy way of saying how your body metabolizes medicine. And by the way, if I say pharmacogenetics and PGX, it's the same thing, it's just the acronym for it. So when Scott you know, started looking at um, why people were getting certain medications, uh, why certain weren't, it went down to their healthcare provider and formularies at the end of the day of what medications were being reimbursed for. And he said, well, you know, gosh, if you think about that, is that the right medication for the individual? So fast forward five or six years, uh, where it's been in the product development uh, stages where to where we launched in August of last year, and we are implementing our, our B2C, our B2B um, uh, programs, and B2C is the obvious is, you know, you go to our website, you go to Amazon, you buy it as an individual, the B2B would be that we're going to um, a lot of um, uh, unions, municipalities, institutions, corporations that are self-insured, who understand that quite honestly, the, the age of the cost of healthcare is just gone disproportionate. Um, if, if you look around, I mean, healthcare, if you looked at the recent presidential debates, uh, it was a number one topic. And I think uh, statistically it's around 32% of the population think that healthcare is the most important thing. So what we've done within PharmaZam, and Scott's gonna go through it, and, and quite honestly, this may sound odd, but it, it might be better that we actually had a Zoom conference in this case, because we're gonna show you the visual of the app itself, and then we're gonna talk about uh, how you can go about it, navigate it, so forth, um, in, in your own, uh, like I so said, with your Android or your Apple phone. So what PharmaZam looks for at the end of the day is once you embed, and Scott will go through this, your profile, it looks for any potential interaction between drug to drug, uh, drug to gene, uh, as I said before, drug to lifestyle, your medical condition, so forth, to see if there's a uh, problem there. Um, it, Jim brought up a point that I, I am a, an avid reader and, and uh, one of the things I do like to read are biographies and history. And in typical, uh, most books have a, um, I don't know, a quote at the beginning of a chapter of the book. And, and one of my favorite is from fame, T.S. Eliot. And, he, uh, and Jim, I'll let you have this as a topic for a different time, but he starts off the, um, uh, the quote of, you know, where's the life we've lost in living? Jim, you and I can have that conversation later. But the second one is, is where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? And where is the knowledge we've lost in information? Now just turn that upside down. Just because it's information doesn't mean it's knowledge, and just because it's knowledge doesn't mean it's, it's, uh, it's wisdom. So that was the lifelong ambition of, of T.S. Eliot, is to try to figure out where we've lost that. It, what's fascinating now is 
it, we are tons of information. Um, uh, we're all now statisticians. We're all now geneticists. I'm talking about in the, in the COVID days. Uh, we're all now mayors and, and, and um, head of municipalities of when we should open up the, uh, um, uh, our townships or our businesses. So th this, the one thing that is actually not so hidden, but it's usually not voiced out there are the statistics on the information age about adverse drug reactions, as well as what they call um, non-optimized medication. And non-optimized, again, is a fancy way of saying where people are, are not adherent to the drugs that they're taking. He, here's some examples or literally some statistics uh, that I think are, are quite honestly uh, outstanding. And remember, the statistics we're talking about here are adverse drug reactions and non-adherence to medication, which is another way of saying is these are preventable. So on an annual basis, when you put those two together, it's between 250 to 200, 275,000 deaths a year to those two, 250 to 275,000 uh, deaths a year. The cost is about $500 billion to our medical system. If you put that in content, um, our spend for medical is around a little over $3 trillion, which by the way is around 17, 18% of our GDP. So 500 billion is about 16% of our healthcare cost is again on adverse drug reactions as well as um, uh, non-adherence. It's the third, given what the years that you look at, it's either the third or fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, there are close to 300, excuse me, about 3.5 million physicians uh, visits that people take because of ADRs and not adherence. Um, about a, uh, a million emergency room visits due to ADRs, uh, 125,000 hospital admittances. And by the way, a lot of ADRs actually happen within the hospital. Um, so when you put all that together, those are big numbers. And I'm not going to sit here and compare it versus the deaths of COVID and other things like that. But just understand uh, why this is important now that a firm like a Pharmazam is saying we can't really wait on the medical community, the larger, broader medical community, the hospital system uh, to, uh, to evaluate their uh, healthcare records and stuff like that. M most things in life, at least prolonged, are, um, are a derivation of the consumer taking uh, action. And it's the consumer, as we know, is two thirds of our economy. And so therefore, what we're doing at Pharmazam through technology, through our app, is encouraging individuals to, yes, purchase the app, and we're gonna talk about why on the COVID part, we were going out at least for the majority of what the app does for free. I'll talk about that or Scott will in a minute. Um, but just to make sure to at least have the knowledge in their hands, or as I like to say, to reduce the margin of error. We're never gonna eliminate error, but if we can reduce the margin of error, or another way of saying it, is if we can increase um, you know, the, the presence of knowledge as well as, as just getting it right the first time. Uh, medicine, as you know, is uh, still trial and error. You go to the doctor, they give you a prescription, they ask you to come back in two or three weeks, we'll give them a call, see if it's working or not, if not, another one, another one, another one, until finally it gets it right. What we're trying to do, again, is elevate precision to the practice of medicine. So. I'm gonna stop here for a second. We've gone through the statistics. I've given you an overview of who Pharmazam is. Um, the, the reason that, uh, again, I'm glad this is a Zoom conference, is this is a visual story. So um, with that, Scott's gonna come in, we're gonna literally put up the, um, uh, what will look like your iPhone, and we're gonna navigate through that, then we'll uh, add a little comment to as we go along the way, then we'll obviously, I think Jim said, have some time for, Q&A here toward the end. So, Scott, I'm going to turn the uh, baton to you, and uh, let's go from there. Great. Thank you, Philip. And thank you, Jim, and the rest of the Rotary Club for having Pharmazam uh, present our, our app to you today. Um, I want to share my screen now, and you're going to get a visual, uh, as Philip was saying, of the app. See me a thumbs up. You can see that. Everyone's okay? Yep. Okay. So yeah, this is our mobile app. And as Philip said, this uh, was launched last year in August. Uh, it's available in the iPhone, uh, iTunes store, as well as the Android, Google Play store. So you could download it today for free, as he said. Uh, the crux of the app, though, is uh, behind the genetics. So 
just like a 23 and me, you, some of you may have taken those tests. We have a, we have a kit with a swab in it. It's much like, it looks like a Q-tip. And you can buy that on Amazon, as Philip mentioned. Uh, you can buy it through our website. And you take the swab and you swab your cheeks and send that back to us. And then we take that kit and we send it off to our partnering labs. And after a few weeks of uh, analysis, they come back and give us all the data about your genetics. Okay, so you can then, uh, the app can then report on your genetic profile. And so you can see here, when you launch the app, uh, we are logged in as a test patient or a test user called Dr. Zan. And the very first thing you'll see here is a big button that says your genetics results are linked. And so uh, this person has done the test already. We have their information. Uh, as we said before, you can download for free the app. You just won't get any of the genetic information uh, that's involved in the app with that. So, so I want to go through the app and show you uh, kind of what it's all about and how this works and, and actually how it relates to, to COVID. The home screen here is really geared towards uh, entering your personal information. It's not a very, very long process. Uh, we need to collect that information so we can report on your particular profile. And the first thing you'll do is you'll click on My Medication. Okay, after you download the app, you come in here, and we want to just get a list of all the medications that you're on. So you can see here, we've pre-filled out some, some medications that this person's on. You could add a new medication. Uh, so you click the button to say Add New, and you just simply type in the name of the medications that you're on. So you do this one at a time. I'm going to select Paroxetine. Uh, as I start typing in, a list of medications show up. Uh, just a little side note, this list of medications that is, is displaying comes from the world's largest database uh, or provider of medical information. They're called First Data Bank. And what that means, a real-time feed is, you know, if there's a new medicine uh, or a medication that comes out on the market overnight, it'll show up in this list. It's not a static list. We pull it real-time as you're using the app. So that's very important to understand. Uh, once you find the medication that you're interested in, maybe I'm on the 40 milligram version of the paroxetine, uh, the app's gonna ask you if you wanna just add that to your profile. You can say yes. And, and similarly, you can, you can delete and remove medications the same way that you can add them. Pretty simple process to add medications. The second thing we need to collect is your medical history or any kind of diseases or illnesses that you have. And for this patient, we've got uh, arthritis and gout. Uh, we could add other things, uh, say celiac disease, for example. Okay, and so on and so forth. You just enter all your illnesses on this, on this tab here. Finally, we want to collect your allergies. And this is important as well because we can report on drug to allergies just like we can drug to drug or drug to, uh, drug to uh, illnesses. We can report on allergies as well. So enter your allergies here. Okay, so now we've got your medications. We've got your medical history. We've got your allergies. And then finally, we want to ask some general lifestyle questions. Okay, things like things that you may consume on a daily basis, citrus or fiber, um, and then even down to things like soda and tea and milk. Um, and even more importantly, alcohol. You, know, you drink alcohol. This comes into play later. You're going to see where there's actually, as you can imagine, medications that do not react well with alcohol, and you can report on those kinds of things. Okay, so then once you've saved your profile with your lifestyle questions, we now have enough information to start doing a lot of things and reporting on a lot of different things. And uh, before I get into the crux of the app, uh, I want to do point out, I want to point out the COVID drug check button that we have, because that's, that's very important. And I want to, I want to emphasize that this can be done for free. I know, I know that I said that you can, you have to buy a kit, but the drug check actually checks, it's just a drug to drug check. So once you enter your medications, you can then click this button and it's going to go out and it's going to look at all the medications you're on compared against this list here that we've come up with, our, our scientific team has identified about 50 separate medications uh, that are COVID related, okay, that you would take, uh, your, your physician may, may recommend that you take for COVID. And one of them obviously is hydroxychloroquine, you may have heard of that in the news, uh, and some others. So what we're doing is we're comparing the drugs that you entered in your profile against uh, COVID related drugs and immediately giving you any kind of re reactions that may happen. And you can see right off the bat, for this, for this particular person, they're on a medication called fluconazole. And that's um, it's actually an antifungal. And believe it or not, there's a very major reaction between hydroxychloroquine and the fluconazole. And it could it actually lead to a life-threatening cardioarrhythmia. So I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanted to bring this up first, just to, to let you know right off the bat that we would we'd really want you to go out and we encourage you to download the app for free and at least enter your drugs and, and, to, and click this button to see you know, if you do happen to find yourself in a situation where you're on some of these other medications for COVID, uh, that you could at least check to be sure that, that, that it's going to work out 
okay, and some of the interactions. You're not going to have any major interactions. So it's a very useful button, a very timely button that we've entered uh, and added to our app recently, which is, which is very important, we believe. Uh, but the, the, the crux of the app uh, is really, it's in the same vein. We have this button here called Drug Warnings, and it does a lot of the same things that the COVID button does. It does drug-to-drug -drug interactions. But now, more importantly, we have other interactions that we can report on, including your genetics. And if you remember, I said, uh, you know, this particular patient has already done the swab. We got their genetic information. So we can report on something called a drug to gene interaction. So now we know your genetics. We can say, hey, look, uh, the warfarin that you're taking against your particular ge you know, genotype or diplotype here uh, is a, a possible threat here. So there's a possible major interaction with, with that medication you're on and your particular genetics. Um, that you may need a lower dose of warfarin compared to other people. So we can get down to the granular level of knowing what your, what your genetics are and what to kind of recommend here. And our scientists have you know, taken the time to go out and kind of come up with these warnings. This is all proprietary information that we, that we have for the drug to gene interactions. But the other interactions that you see here, um, you can see that there's a drug to food interaction and this one's in yellow. And um, so the most important the most severe interactions appear at the top on the red. But as we scroll down, we see some other interactions that aren't genetically related. And these are things that you would get for free with the app, including the drug to food interaction. Um, and in this, in this case, is saying that um, the warfarin that you're taking, uh, you, you may want to, um, the, the, the vitamin K and the warfarin may, may have a, a, an interaction here. Uh, as well as some other drug to drug interactions. Again, that fluconazole that we're taking against the warfarin that we're taking. Um, has some other side effects as well, and some other interactions, so so on and so forth. You can see we list out all the different interactions that we can that we can find uh, based on what you entered and what your what your genetic profile uh, is made up of. Okay, and if we scroll down further, you can start seeing some greens that are a little. Um, here's a drug disease interaction. If you remember, we typed in that we had celiac disease. Well, evidently the warfarin and the celiac disease. Not, not a huge risk, but there's just a moderate warning that we have. And uh, just to point out again, the, the interactions that we're coming up with for drug to disease and drug to drug, these, these, these are coming from that first data bank, database that we mentioned as well. So this is not something that we're making up. It's actually a proven studies done by other companies. So this is really the crux of the app is the, the, the interactions. Um, I wanna also point out another way to kind of see this is through something called drug classes. And so what we've done is we've created a button where um, let's say that you're with your physician and you are um, uh, depressed or you're, you're experiencing depression and you're considering going on antidepressant. Well, you could go look at here and say, okay, what, what category is that? What kind of drug class is that? Would that be under mental health? And so when you click this button, uh, we have 27 drugs that we have information on under this button that would from top to bottom list out what medications would be best for your genetic profile versus which ones are worse. So you could actually sit down with your physician, you could send them a report of these drugs as well. But basically, this is information that your, that your physician wouldn't necessarily know, right? It's genetic information. And a lot of times, uh, some of you may have experienced this where you, you sit down with your physician and they say, oh, you know, try this medication. If that doesn't work, come back and we'll try something else. Well, this takes out the guesswork of that uh, to a certain degree. And you can see here that um, here's some anti, um, uh, some mental health medications. Um, you know, so particularly the sertraline and some of these in green are a better, uh, would be probably better for you than uh, some of the ones in red. And the ones in red, um, why, are they, why are they particularly bad for you? There's some clinical explanation here. I won't, I won't dig into the details of this, but your doctor can probably look at this and say, oh, here's some, some really good solid reasons why I may not want to prescribe this, this particular medication to you based on your genetics. So very, very helpful, well, very helpful tab there to kind of see uh, in a class level what is and isn't uh, uh, particularly going to go well with you. Hey, Scott, if I can interrupt you for two seconds here. Um, the reason that we think, I mean, we get into cardio, pulmonary, and, and other um, drug classes and stuff like that, probably the one thing that's going to set us apart more than anything is a mental health issue. And for those who are physicians or in the medical space would know this already, but typically the, the medication you take for anything having to do with mental health issues takes at least two, three, five weeks just to see if there's efficacy for it, see if it works at all. Um, so if you 
basically go to the medication and say, well, you know, this one may not work. You may go through three or four or five different drugs before the sixth one or so works. That's, you know, a half to two thirds of a year that's gone by before this patient gets the right medication. As we know with mental health issues, uh, that's, you know, very sensitive time. And then the other thing with medications dealing with mental health issues is because it takes so long to work within the system, there's residual um, uh, parts of the, the drug that you were taking that could have an effect was called causation, that something causes something else not to work or it's, it's defeating it's, its own purpose. So again, another big reason why we're saying reduce the margin of error, elevate precision, try to get it right the first time. And we just think that things having to do with um, uh, anything with the medical history of uh, mental illness and stuff like that is probably as critical as anyone. So sorry, Scott, just take off. No, thank you, Philip. Uh, I know that we're, we're kind of running out of time here and we want to leave some time for questions. Uh, but just real quickly, there, there's a lot more to this app. We don't have time today to go through the rest. But just so you know, there is some other features that we have, uh, such as searching by name. You can use a barcode scanner to search for medications to see what kind of interactions you may have. Uh, let's say you're in the drugstore, even over-the-counter drugs will work in the app. You, could, you can use a barcode scanner, the camera on the phone, to actually scan the medication's uh, barcode, and it'll tell you whether those uh, ingredients in that particular um, medicine may, may or may not be good for you. Uh, other things real quickly we have, we have a family share feature as well. Let's say you have children or uh, an elderly uh, mother that you, that you want to kind of check in on, you can literally uh, switch profiles from one user to the other uh, with our family share feature. So let's say that um, you know, my daughter, Pam Zam, I want to create a profile for her as well. I can switch over and in do the same kind of interactions, the same kind of detail that I did for myself, I could do for my daughter and kind of switch back and forth. So a couple other quick things that we have there, as well as reports. And you know, honestly, um, a lot of this is geared towards the physician and, and, and sharing information with them so they understand um, your profile and what's best for you. So we have reports that you could send to your physician with all the same kind of information that you see in the app um, so that they can help make better decisions for you. Uh, and I know we're pretty much out of time here, so I wanted just to wrap that up and give you a, a little little preview of some of the things that we have. And with that, maybe, Philip, I'll just turn it back over to you, and maybe we have um, some time for questions and answers. Sure. Thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, just to uh, say that the COVID a crisis that you know we all um, were inducted to, so to speak, a month and a half ago or so, or end of last year, but here in the United States, a month and a half ago, is what has thrown us into a spotlight. We actually had a press release out uh, two weeks ago telling people because hydroxychloroquine was, as we've seen, that's just been on the news every day. Is it effectiveness or not? And so our um, our petition to the community is at least go to the app store, your Android store, De go to PharmZam, download the app, uh, at least do the drug to drug. Uh, you can look at drug to allergies. Um, the drug to gene would require the swab, as we said earlier, to be sent off to our labs and back and forth, but at least do that because two thirds of all adverse drug reactions uh, are, have to do with drug to drug or drug to allergies, drug medication. Uh, about a, a third, excuse me, a third of them our drug to gene. So eventually we're encouraging people, you know, when they buy the kit to elevate to the drug to gene, because again, that's about a third of the uh, reasons for adverse drug reactions. So uh, with that, I know there's probably a ton of questions um, or at least thoughts about this. This is uh, an area that, that we feel very strongly about. The, the only reason that pharmacogenetics has not been in the mainstream in the last several years is if you go back 10 years or so, it literally cost a million dollars to run a sequencing of your genes uh, to go. So it was just no other way of saying it, it was just cost prohibitive. And now that it's several hundred dollars in the last year or two, uh, we're able to like the farmers Ams to come in and say, we can now do this and where the consumer can look at it as a purchase or the corporation so forth. So. I'm going to leave it at that. Jim, hand it back to you. We can't hear you, Jim. I think Jim's on mute. Oh, I'm on mute. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me now? 
All right, great. So, um, Philip, I'll start off. I've got a question. I think uh, Valerie, our ringmaster, and Linda have been receiving incoming questions. Uh, I saw Mary Moss had a question, but uh, so this is a startup company. Um, you've been heading it for about a year. Uh, it's 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 novel technology. It's cutting edge. It's online. It's empowering the consumer. Um, how is this being received by the medical establishment, by physicians, hospitals, by others involved in healthcare generally? It's a great question. We, we get that all the time. And I'm not going to bifurcate it into two areas. There's 20, but let's just get it down to two. Uh, the first one is, you know, those, everyone knows this is where medicine is going. Pharmacogenetics is where med precision medicine is where everything is going. If you take a population of, um, uh, physicians who, let's say, didn't study molecular science in the last, you know, three, five, ten years or so, th there may be a little bit of apprehension of just not understanding the data, uh, even though they can, they have access to the data. This is not uh, Pharmazam's data. They, they can do a pharmacogenetic test any day um, on typically one panel. So the embracement is either this is the greatest thing. This is going to help us with my or me with my practice or you know, reduce error or uh, do my part to reduce the cost through ADR and so forth. And the other one is just, it's a learning curve, it's education. And a lot of people, and um, let's just call it your, your primary care physician practices are actually hiring geneticists uh, in their practice. Say, you know what, I don't need to want, or want to learn or need to learn. It's just taking too much of my time. So I'm going to give you know the diagnosis to our geneticists. The geneticists, in turn, will get with the pharmacists. And by the way, if there's a group that absolutely loves pharmacogenetics and what we're doing are pharmacists, because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are ultimately handling the prescription to the uh, to the patient. So it's a mix, but without question, Jim, everyone knows that precision medicine is where we're going, and in some form or fashion, they're going to have to answer this call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a great liability saver, potential liability saver, too, for physicians and hospitals and pharmacists. As only a lawyer can put it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, other questions uh, from the ringmaster or Linda? Uh, I have a question, Philip, and it was a great talk. Thank you so much. And I was just wondering, uh, you know, nowadays you hear so much about security breaches. What do you all do? to protect uh, patients' security and be in compliance with HIPAA laws? Uh, great question, Scott. This is your bailiwick. Even though I have a good answer, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, of course, that is a very, very, very uh, serious topic that we, we also take seriously. We, we partnered with Microsoft to, to host our database, our database of our data, uh, a, a product called Azure, you may, may have heard of it. Um, th they, they have the top-notch security and um, we would kind of rely on them for to protect all that data. You know, it's all encrypted, you know, double encrypted, if you will. And so there's really no problems there. We make sure that we have a, our relationship with them keeps the, the data completely encrypted and, and uh, no breaches can happen. Thank you. I think Elsa has a question, Elsa. Elsa. Um, great talk, Philip. Thank you so much. So, <clears throat> um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, who is your primary focus and who are you rolling this out to? Is it to individuals or is it to healthcare systems or physician practices? And then, what can this help do for the non compliant patient? Because that's what costs hospitals the most money is that non-compliant patient who can't, keeps getting readmitted into the hospital in less than 30 days? Yeah, both loaded questions. Let me give you the business answer first. Again, the B2C, you're right. You can just go as like anything else, just go to the website, um, go through Amazon, and just buy it on one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, th th that's a smaller part of our business, believe it or not. The larger is our B2B, where we're aligning with channel providers in this case would be, let's say, large insurance companies that have employee benefit 
agents out there who are talking to self-insured companies or municipalities or unions, whatever else, and just saying, mm -hmm. let us look at your total spend, your medical spend. Uh, the one thing that's been missing in the total medical spend, and to your point earlier, it could be everything from absenteeism to um, uh, drugs to uh, hospital stays, so forth, is pharmacogenetics. That's one thing that's been missing, which is why you know, a lot of these companies weren't ready four years ago, and we weren't ready four years ago, quite honestly, to do this. Now that the cost has come down, uh, it's not so prohibitive. Uh, the corporations, if, if you take a step back, there's a reason that J.P. Morgan, uh, my old firm, but J.P. Morgan, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and Amazon came together and formed this thing called Haven, if you've heard of this or not, because they basically say, we're not here to cure cancer, but the healthcare cost is now at 18% of GDP. In most developed countries, it's between 9 to 11%. So we are literally double. We have got to find a way to not sacrifice the care, but reduce cost. So when you put that into consideration, they're looking for any, any remote thing, that, which is usually precision medicine, that can reduce the hospital stays, that can reduce the admittance, that can reduce all these other things, or the shared cost or whatever. So all these things are where corporate America really, really gets. You wanna get the attention of the CEO, you definitely got the attention of the CFO of the company. So that's where we're putting a lot of our emphasis is in the, let's say, corporate America. Yes, we are going to, and, and Scott, if we had more time, talk about a physician portal uh, that we have, um, we didn't have time here today, but where a physician can interact with a patient because it's all about the consolidation of the data and the accuracy of the data. And again, to your point of uh, the consumer being compliant along the way, at the end of the day, it's no different than a lot of things, call it def defined benefit to defined contribution, going from pension plans to now 401ks. The consumer is having to take more control of their data, their information, and in this case, healthcare. So we are offering um, our tool to help with that and that it can engage with the physician, with the hospital, so forth. I hope that answers your question. Uh, we also have a, a question in the chat from, I think it's Kurt. Um, is there an alert feature that pushes out new concerns based on the patient's app info load? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, not. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. I'm glad you answered, asked that one. We're working currently on something called a medicine cabinet. And what that does is, you know, if you, look, if you think back to the demo where you entered your medications, we're going to have a button that you push that basically you can then uh, not only enter your uh, more granular details about that medication, but you can start assigning um, uh, reminders and saying, hey, when is it time to take this medication? And with that, we'll also know uh, that you can receive, uh, th then we'll know if, like I said before, we, you know, we're, we're partnered with First Data Bank and they report on things uh, overnight that may happen. So if there's a recall of a drug, for example, um, we'll be able to push that out to you through that medicine cabinet feature that we're rolling out to say, hey, boom, a message will pop on your phone and say, hey, we know that you're on that fluconazole, by the way, uh, you know, it's been recalled or that does not interact well with hydroxychloroquine, for example. Uh, but in addition, we'll be able to do reminders and alerts for when it's time to take your medications and time for refills and those kinds of things. So that's a great, a great question. And, and we are working on that and um, hope to have that out probably next quarter. All right. Well, let me step in here as um, we try to be punctual as uh, Rotarians. Uh, and it, I'm, I'm sure that Philip and Scott would be uh, glad to answer further questions if you can email them. Um, but you can check out you can check out the uh, the website, uh, and uh, it, it's it's going to be the wave of the future. Uh, it sounds like to me. So Philip and Scott, I want to thank you for an excellent presentation today. If you can reduce the 270,000 deaths annually in the U.S. from adverse drug interactions and you can improve patient outcomes and, and, and shorten the time frame for getting to uh, the right treatment and make the, the treatment more effective, more uh, precise for the individual patient. That is going to be tremendous, a tremendous advance for healthcare in this country. So thanks for what you're doing. Um, normally we would present the coveted rotary mug the coveted rotary coffee mug to you in person. 
Uh, it sounds like you're going to need that good shot of Java in the morning that only the rotary coffee mug can deliver. So I am going to uh, hand you that in person the next time we're able to meet. So, uh, and that has the four-way uh, test on it. Um, so thank you uh, very much. And so let's have a virtual round of applause for Philip and Scott for uh, this presentation on PharmaZam. So in, in closing, before we get to the four-way test, I just want to uh, let everyone know our, our lineup for the rest of, of May. Dr. Jamie Ver Vernon, who is a leading scientific figure, uh, and he is going to speak on 21st century scientific challenges. May 11, we've got an incredible program with Burke Kuntz, who is a Raleigh investment advisor who has made a, uh, an acclaimed film uh, called Betting on Zero. It's on Netflix. It's, it's gotten huge ratings on Rotten Tomatoes and from the critics. Uh, and he's going to speak on, on that film and making the film, May 11. Uh, and then May 18, former Attorney General, former Secretary of State, and now author and attorney Rufus Edmiston is going to speak. Uh, and then we've got a great lineup in, in June as well. Uh, so thank you all so much. Tune in for uh, the rest of May for our, for our meetings. And uh, now... Uh, let me uh, ask all Rotarians to join me in closing with the four-way test, as we always do. Uh, first, is it the truth? Second, is it is fair it to all concerned? Concern? Will it build good will and better friendships? friendships? Will it be, it be beneficial, beneficial to all, all concerned? Concern. Thank you. All right, Rotarians. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Yay. Thank you.